Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and set our motivation. Getting yourself uh, grounded and centered in your space, consciously letting go of anything that's outside of that space. You're connected to it, but not engaged with it. And then awakening our Buddha potential. Tayata Om Mune Mune Maha Munae Soha Tayata Om Mune Mune Maha Connecting with your motivation. and relaxing your attention. Okay. So um, last week we did some more technical concepts and um, we were looking at the nine analogies, which are beautiful and poetic, but they were referring to points that were a little bit technical and a little bit wordy and maybe less familiar. So today I'm just going to do a very brief review of the five paths just so that they feel a little bit more stable. And then we're going to open up a bit more of a conversation about the idea of what is something that is transcendent and how do you connect with the transcendent? And we'll just have a bit more of a spacious kind of conversational class about some of those ideas. And we'll use this section um, from His Holiness's um, debate that we've been looking at to kind of get the, the juices flowing. So there'll be um, just a very brief review today and then, um, and then some more discussion and talking about ideas and how to integrate them. So um, when we were talking about the five paths, do you, do you have any immediate questions before I go into the review? Just sort of bits that were really unclear? Or you need a minute to warm up? So <clears throat> these five paths, um, these sort of developmental stages um, of Buddhist realization, um, the five pathway awarenesses, these are the transition points where your practice is significantly different and your abilities are significantly greater. This is important for us because we realize that again and again, this concept comes up where there's a lot of um, time to hear, listen, study, time to contemplate, reflect, discuss, process, and time to meditate and go over and integrate. And that process of hearing, contemplating, and meditating on whatever topic it is needs to happen again and again and again, which builds a sort of critical mass or a sort of um, you know, collection of mental momentum and energy, which then becomes the catalyst to pop into the next stage of development. Right, so that everything becomes easier through repetition. It's the main idea. Everything is easier through repetition. And understanding in something intellectually is not the same thing as understanding something experientially. So these are concepts that are really familiar to us, aren't they? We're just kind of structuring it in a way that's less familiar with words that are less familiar. But the idea that it takes a lot of effort for something to become effortless is something you see everywhere, isn't it? 
takes a lot of effort for something to become effortless. So, um, you know, and this effortlessness or this flow or this transcendence, um, this is something that we touch in many different forms throughout our life, whether we brand it as spiritual or not. And we can fall into the trap of thinking that moments of transcendence are random, are magical, are by coincidence, when in fact they're the result of a cause. There's something that we can orchestrate. There's something that we can manufacture. They, of course, happen to us throughout our life, whether we're aware of the buildup of energy that preceded them or not. But if we understand that there's a buildup of energy before a moment of transcendence or connection, then we can start to work on that more intentionally and take more of control of our own mental processes, right? So if we start with the beginning, the first thoughts that you're having are, is samsara satisfactory? Yeah, is the fact that I have uncontrolled birth, old age, sickness, and death acceptable and necessary? You know, it's just a thought. Is it acceptable? Is it necessary? Or is it so profoundly poignant and tragic and needless? Yeah, birth seems like a beautiful thing, and it is a beautiful thing, but the actual birthing process Painful, messy, hard on everyone involved. Of course, leads to baby, yay baby, but you know, the actual process, not fun for anyone, even if there's moments of transcendence within that experience, there is pain. You know, aging is happening all the time, less vitality, less, you know, power in different areas. Of course, there's wonderful things about aging. Of course there are, but we kind of make those wonderful things. Um, it's not like just aging itself is great fun for everyone, especially the body, right? The body is not really loving aging so much, I'm guessing. And then we have sickness, which can happen any time throughout our lives. At any time we can get sick, the very same things that give us life can give us death or sickness. Food, right? Air, <laughs> what's riding in it. Um, moisture, what's riding in it. The very things that we look to for life can also be the source of illness and death. Is that necessary? Is that acceptable? These are the thoughts we're working on when we're trying to develop the determination to be free from samsara when we're trying to develop a strong intention to definitively emerge, real renunciation is looking at cultivating a disillusionment that goes together with hope. Yeah, it's like hope and disillusionment together. You're disillusioned with this uncontrolled nature of life. You're disillusioned with the tragedy and the poignancy and all of the grief of life, while at the same time, instead of just making peace with those facts, or just transforming them in the mind as something that we can see and celebrate as beautiful if we you know, think about it the right way, we're actually saying that could stop. That could all stop. And actually my current habits, my current mental habits are what are reinforcing my lack of control. So whether you believe a full exit from samsara is possible, a full release from the negative states of mind and their imprints, you know, that's something that is kind of a personal process to look into. But what we do know is that habits can be broken, but they need confrontation. It needs to be worth it to us, right? And so to think my mind makes a lot of mistakes under the influence of distraction is something that has nothing to do with spirituality, does it necessarily? Completely secular thought. Many of my mistakes come from distraction. If you say that in your own head, is it true? <laughs> Many of my mistakes come from distraction. Is it in my own best interest, in the best interest of my relationships and my work, if I work on being less distracted? Yeah. <laughs> Right? And so we want to be disillusioned with distraction, right? If you're wanting to make it completely secular and away from all of this kind of past and future lives, death, birth, blah, blah, controlled or not controlled, just ask yourself, is it worth being disillusioned with distraction? And I think we can all agree that it is, because when we're focused, we're more powerful. When we're focused, we're kinder, right? When we're focused, we're more effective and also we enjoy life more. 
things don't miss our attention. So this, uh, this introductory path, the path of accumulation, you need uncontrived bodhicitta, you need uncontrived renunciation. These are Buddhist spiritual terms. But for you, if you're not on board with the whole fully fledged concept of it, ask yourself, for the sake of working for sentient beings, it actually is worth my energy to shift from cultivating distracting habits to cultivating focused habits, right? It's worth my while to shift from self-centered, self-obsessed, self-conscious ways of thinking to others-focused, altruistic, empathic ways of thinking. That is our work, right? That's our work. So if you can frame it in that way, then the idea of the path of accumulation can be a bit more accessible, you know? And that the critical mass or the buildup of energy that leads to that opening up is something that we're working on even now. Any time that we choose focus over distraction, altruism over selfishness, you know? And that every time we do that is reinforcing a positive pathway in our mind, which is leading to a developmental shift. Yeah, and there comes a point where a certain level of focus is more your natural focus. You don't have to work on it as hard for that to be the case. There comes a point where a certain level of selfishness doesn't come up as often because you've trained yourself out of it. You know, so there, there are shifts like this happening all the time. It's just that in the in between, between how we've always been and how we want to be, in the in-between, there's this kind of long autumn desert something kind of feeling where you're not sure if any work is being done because you're not noticing the shift right away. You know, and so this, this relies on a little bit of faith based in experience and reasoning to kind of get yourself from point A to point B that the repetition is worth it. Yeah. So the path of accumulation, bodhicitta, determination to be free, that's the gateway for a Mahayana practitioner. Yeah, that's the gateway. And once you have these uncontrived experiences, you are a fundamentally less distracted, less selfish being. It's just more natural for you to be focused. It's more natural to you, for you to be altruistic. You don't have to work as hard at it because you've kind of broken through the first barriers of it. Does that make sense? So path of accumulation called path of accumulation, because you're accumulating more merit to be able to actually access reality. So you accumulating merit, different stages of that. And during the different stages of that, you're still developing and getting good work done. Sometimes you're meditating, sometimes you're having a normal life, you're doing this and that, but it's always imbued with bodhicitta and renunciation, always uncontrived. It's become a main mind. It's a pathway awareness. And once you've developed a lot of merit of wisdom and a lot of merit of the, the method side, then what you're doing is you're trying to bring in your analytical abilities and your single pointed abilities into union. You know, they need to be worked on as separate projects. Some, some forms of Buddhism work on them as simultaneous projects, even from the very beginning. But the danger in that from our perspective is that you start being a little bit too indulgent of what your afflictions want to do. It's like my affliction wants to be analytical. Now it's bored of analysis. It'll be single pointed. Now it's bored of single pointed. It'll be analytical. And you just kind of go with whatever the mind feels like rather than kind of taking the reins and saying, right now you're doing this until you get to a point where you can't maintain that in a clear way. Now you're consciously intentionally shifting to that. Yeah, rather than letting it be quite so, quote, organic and natural, because organic and natural usually means driven by afflictions. So you're working on them as separate projects, you bring them together, gradually, gradually, the union of calm abiding, right, single pointedness, special insight directed on emptiness analytically, those two coming together conceptually is the path of preparation.
Yeah, this is called the path of preparation. So it takes a very strong mind to be able to hold single pointedness and bring in analysis without that disturbing the mind. Yeah, it's very hard for us. We can't do it yet. So we work on them as separate projects and then gradually bring them together, particularly on the subject of emptiness, because that's what's going to cut the root of samsara. So you're preparing the path of prepare, preparation. You're preparing to realize emptiness, to see emptiness directly instead of just a conceptualization of how emptiness is given what your logic, reasoning, and intelligence tell you. You're moving from that intellectual understanding to the direct experience. So if you don't have a correct intellectual understanding, if you don't have a correct logic about what exactly emptiness is, what things are empty of, then you're actually not going to have a fully fledged type of seeing. There's still a shroud of ignorance around your seeing, which is going to prevent a level of development. So that's why the four tenant schools are taught in Buddhism, where you're sort of understanding that a lot is negated by understanding emptiness. It's a non-affirming negation, which doesn't imply anything in its place. And that is a profound and subtle point that is easily misunderstood. We kind of gradually work our way into it. So on the path of preparation, you are meditating again and again with your very even, very steady single pointedness with your very sharp analytical mind that has been educated correctly. And it is purely through the repetition of that that you move from conception to perception. It's, it's purely through familiarity, the momentum of merit of both merit of wisdom and merit of method. It's through that repetition that you move from conception to perception. And at that point, you have the path of seeing. that moment of truth, which is just one session, one meditation session, where you move from the path of preparation to the path of seeing. Those three making sense? So then the very next meditation session, you're on the path of meditation. path of meditation is longer. Um, how long very much depends on how much work you're getting done, how much merit you have. Um, but on the path of meditation, there are what are called the 10 grounds or the 10 boomies or the 10 levels, depending on your translator. Annoying and frustrating, but now you know, so it's fine. <laughs> okay, so the 10 levels are levels of obscuration that are that are overcome both in meditation on emptiness and in subsequent attainment yeah so on the cushion and off the cushion on the cushion and off the cushion on the cushion you're meditating on emptiness directly only emptiness appears and that has the ability to purify and clear eons and eons of negative karmic seeds yeah, they, it's like a blowtorch, you know, across all these seeds, so they're burnt and no longer able to sprout into suffering. Right now, when we purify, we're doing a few at a time. We're getting them burnt. They're not able to, to cause suffering in the future. We're getting the job done, but it, it's got a small amount, right? And we create so much negative karma in a day that it's a little bit like, you know, purify, accumulate more, purify, accumulate more. And that's why samsara is as if endless. Yeah, it's as if it's endless because so far we haven't kind of gotten ahead of our purification practice. Once you realize emptiness directly, your purification is light years ahead. Yeah. So the first seven levels, you're getting rid of all of the obscurations from afflictions, all of the afflictive obscurations those ones that are innate, and those ones that are intellectually acquired. You with me? So the first seven levels, that's what you're getting up to. When all of those seeds are burnt, 
Yeah, you've taken a blowtorch to them all through the power of your realization of emptiness. What are left are the imprints. Yeah, or like um, the smell of the burnt seed or the impression of true existence or inherent existence that you no longer believe, but still obscures you from full omniscience. Inherent, or things no longer are believed to be inherently existent, but they still seem that way. They still look that way. You see a difficult person and you still, they still seem to be difficult from their own side, but you know better now. But the fact that they even appear that way prevents your full omniscience and able to benefit everyone expansively, equally, etc. So the last three levels of the path of meditation, you're getting rid of all of the imprints. Yeah, everything that prevents omniscience. So you're clearing the, the um, obscurations of knowledge or the knowledge obscurations or the obscurations to omniscience. These are all synonyms. Those are cleared. And once you've cleared all of those, you achieve the path of no more learning, which is Buddhahood. So then done, then just benefiting sentient beings, very happy, merging with the Dharmakaya, all is well. Yeah, and then you just keep benefiting sentient beings, helping sentient beings in whatever way they can be helped given their karmic obscurations. But you know exactly what could work and what would work. So you try to do the best you can given their conditions. And that is the work you do until every single sentient being is enlightened but it's no problem and you're not bored because you have no more causes for suffering in your continuum. Yeah, so we just keep getting the work done and eventually every single sentient being will be enlightened. Obviously there's some folks we're gonna have to wait a while for them to get their act together, but no one is a lost cause. Okay. So that's the summary of the five paths. Did you have any, any thoughts or questions about that before we move into a discussion about some other things? The, the key things to hear for us at our level are disillusionment with samsara is very important. Disillusionment with negative habits is very important. And it's very hard because we can get away with having a happy enough life just doing what we've always done. Right? We're nice enough people, we're smart enough people that we can kind of get away with having a good enough life and we could just have a good enough life and that would be good. <laughs> Yay. And so to have real disillusionment, you, it really helps to have bodhicitta, right? To think, I do benefit sentient beings. I'm a kind person. I'm a good citizen. I'm a good friend. I'm a good person. I'm doing good in this world. But actually, I would be a lot more effective if I wasn't so distracted. And I would be a lot more effective if I was more altruistic. And actually I'd be happier too. To really sit with sentient beings need me. Right now my radius of impact exists. We all have a radius of impact, yeah? Where, we're, you know, kind of a circle of people that we have a positive influence over. That that circle could be wider and that benefit could be deeper if we were more disillusioned with our negative habits. Yeah, and that's the thing is to really sit with, there are so few people in this world who have the conditions that we have, right? To be safe, to be healthy, to be supported. We just take it for granted as if it's just the way people live to be safe, healthy, and supported. But it's actually incredibly rare percentage wise if you really think about it, yeah? And especially if you think of all sentient beings, not just humans. So to have that thought of, if not me, who, right? And you think, oh, I'm just little, just little old me. I can't do anything for sentient beings. I'll just be a nice neighbor and good to my kids. And that's okay, that's enough. It's actually laziness, yeah? 
because you have everything. Yeah, you have everything you need to be of benefit to sentient beings. And so to not use it, they say, is like a returning empty handed from a land of jewels. Right? You went there, you saw it, you thought it was pretty, and then you just came back without anything with you. So it's not like a scolding, right? It's like, it's a, it's a kind of kick in the bum to make you happy and inspired of, actually, why not me? Actually me, I think I'm going to have to do this. Oh, man. All right. You know, and you kind of just have to steady yourself and, you know, get your shoulders straightened and proceed. And we'll make mistakes and we'll do it imperfectly. But we are the rare ones that have health and safety and support. We are rare, right? So if we don't use it and we just, you know, Netflix binge our life away, that's really a shame, right? So just really gently nudging yourself out of your negative habits with a healthy disillusionment that doesn't try to rip yourself from all of your samsaric comforts, but gently disengages from the ones that you actually no longer need. Because there's a lot of samsaric habits that at one point in our life made sense and were necessary um, forms of like self-soothing that we've actually grown out of. We've developed out of and we're fine without them, but we give ourselves permission to do them because at one point they were necessary. Yeah, and you can think of your own life and what habits those would be, but there are a lot of things that keep us stirred up and excessively stimulated and full of distractions, mental distractions, that are actually unnecessary mental habits and unnecessary physical habits. And maybe you notice during this time where we've been quarantined that there's a lot of like outside busyness that we just don't do because we can't do. And because of that, there actually can be some space for some creativity, unless your mind is too full of pan panic and anxiety, which would be totally normal and natural. But on those days when you're not full of panic and anxiety or you know what's gonna happen next and what if, the days you're just like, I don't have to go anywhere today. Huh, this is great. I don't have to drive today, this is great. There's space and possibility that opens up. And you could give yourself permission to have that even when you do travel again, even as we do go back into kind of our quote normal life, you could carry a little bit of that. I don't need to be busy as a criteria for my worth. I don't have to glorify being busy as if it's a virtue. In fact, a lot of my busyness is completely unnecessary and steals energy from my path of development. So actually, let's let life stay simpler, yeah? Because then it'll be deeper. Do you know what I mean? So some of the simplicity, yeah, uh, what's not, yeah. Um, I was just thinking that I, like, I agree with everything you say, and we are very privileged, and yet I think all of us live in samsara, and we do know misery, and we do know pain, and I think that we ourselves are not sure always how to handle with it. And is there something beyond it? And so I think when we feel privileged, it's amazing. But when we don't, like, I don't know if we get confused or we, we don't know the answers. Yeah, you're, so you're that's stuff but you don't know what to do with it yeah you're like i feel lucky but i don't know what to do with that luckiness because i also have all no. these yeah because sometimes i'm not lucky and i don't feel lucky and i am miserable even though i have everything so yeah sometimes even because you have everything that can make you miserable because you think oh no i should be doing more i'm such a terrible person why don't i use all these amazing resources i have right that can happen too or you have amazing resources but you're used to it and so the mind will find a way to destroy its own peace you know i think um it is interesting when we meet people that are very well off financially who have happy stable marriages and successful children and healthy pets i don't know beautifully manicured gardens and excellent fashion taste and they are not necessarily more happy than people that are very destitute 
Um, and, you know, when you go to developing nations, you notice some very, very poor people looking quite happy and content, possibly more than us. And you go, oh, all right, <laughs> you know, what's going on there? Yeah. And I think that this is the piece of how do you hit disillusionment with samsara without losing hope that freedom is possible? Because just disillusionment, we can, we can come up with, right? We could think about any number of political situations. We could think about any number of family crises, any number of our patients who are really worried about. You could think about any number of things and get quite disillusioned with samsara. But are you disillusioned with hope that breaking the wheel is possible? And that confidence, that faith, that conviction with hope that you can break the patterns is what kind of gives life back to your practice. And it relies a lot on your memory of your prior transformation. Yeah, it, it relies a bit on your memory of the potential for change and learning to give you some willpower to stay steady through the hard times when you are feeling quite oppressed and, you know, quite, I don't know, out of sync and not so supported and whatever you know, to kind of carry you through to remember that there is nothing that's going to destroy your Buddha potential. Yeah, there's just times when its development is somewhat delayed or on pause, but never at any point is that fundamental potential for transformation gone. Yeah, and so, you know, then you might have to revert back to self-soothing techniques that you thought you no longer needed um, you know, you might need to eat a whole chocolate cake. I don't know what you get up to, but you know, to do it with some kindness and some humor that helps you feel connected to the human condition. You know, I was talking to a friend earlier today about how um, I was having a bit of brain fog, you know, this feeling brain fog where you just like, I cannot string two sentences together. I, I like my, it's just like there's cobwebs in my brain and I can't think today and I don't know what's wrong with me. And she's like, well, isn't it quite hot there? And I said, yeah. She's like, yeah, well, it's because it's hot. <laughs> you know. And just saying that, I was like, oh, right, there's nothing cosmically wrong with my brain. I just forgot that there's a few, there's a week of adjustment when the weather changes for the body to kind of recalibrate and get used to it, right? Happens every season, has happened every season of my whole life, yet somehow I've forgotten that, you know, the first week of a new, new kind of temperature situation, there's brain fog, of course. So to you know, relate that to the human condition and to relate that to changes coming, I won't always feel this way, doesn't mean that anything about my current today's brain fog has lifted. I still feel a little bit vague. You know, I still feel a little like I can't string sentences together, but I'm not worried about it now. Do you know what I mean? So it's not like any of the problem has changed. The worry about it has changed, which just frees you back up. So, you know, so this, I know it's a very basic example, and if it's something tragic and really epic in your life, it doesn't sound like it'll work the same way, and yet it does. Yeah, remembering impermanence, remembering the human connection and your human community of people experiencing the same thing, those two things, together with remembering that change and transformation have happened in the past, often as the result of hardship, you relax into the moment a little more. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So other thoughts about um, the five paths? Or any piece of the five paths? Yes, Alan? Yeah. Uh, it, uh, it's written here on the path of uh, normal learning uh, in, in an emphasized uh, graphic or font, uh, the Mahayana pass of normal learning begins at so. On. What does it mean that the, the after of the beginning of this pass? It begins in in this uh, uh, three last points. But what does it mean begins with? What is a what is the later phases of, of this path? Of the path of no more learning? After the beginning. 
Yeah, well, when the, the last three grounds of the path of meditation are um, purified, then you have the beginning of the path of no more learning. To say the beginning is to help us open up the conversation with some Buddhist schools that think that is the end of the continuum. There are some Buddhist schools that think once you're enlightened, your mental continuum finishes. And that's not our view. Our view is the mental continuum continues. It um, is together with all other enlightened continuums and continues to be of benefit to sentient beings. And that's the whole point. So it's like, that's the beginning of your then quote, life as a Buddha. And there is no end to your life as a Buddha. It's the beginning of, you know, pure joy. It's the beginning of pure benefit. Okay. Does that answer the question? Perfectly. Yeah. And so to say begins is, is a little bit of a nudge at other schools of thought that, be, that believe that the path of no more learning is then the end. It's not the end. Okay. So, so what I thought we would kind of discuss a little bit today is this idea of um, manufacturing transcendence, okay? Or touching into transcendence, or what are the things that make you feel the truth of the existence of your Buddha nature, okay? Things that make you feel the truth of it. And so I thought to start with like really ordinary examples from before we met any kind of path in particular, or maybe we had a different path and how we've already touched like a small version of this. So I was trying to think, and I was remembering that when I was a child and probably when you guys were kids, you might've been into music or sports, right? A lot of us were in music or sports or something like this, some sort of art or something like this. And I was remembering that when I played basketball, and I played basketball from the time I was, I don't know, six until I was 15, maybe, because I'm tall, not because I'm good at basketball. I was just, you know, I would block people just by standing there. So it was a good choice for the team. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so I wasn't even good at basketball is the point. And yet there were moments of transcendence in playing basketball. And it wasn't about the success of making a point. It was, the, it was the synchronization of myself with my fellow players, right? When all of you have gone through um, a play, I don't know if you have this word in, in Hebrew or uh, the, plan for this, the plan for the game, you know, this person will hand it to this person who will hand it to this person and then we'll do this to distract the other side, right? So it's, it's something that we had drilled and we've done again and again in practice, right? You'll pass it to them and they'll pass it to her and she'll pass it to them and then you'll make the point and then run that way. And it's something that there, during the drilling and the repetition, sometimes there would be moments of kind of transcendence where we would all synchronize during the drill, but often it was just a drill, right? It was just something you did again and again and again and again. And sometimes it was fun and sometimes it was boring and sometimes it aggravated us and sometimes we fought and sometimes we laughed, but then we would do the game. And during the game, there could be moments where there was the like perfect lift and synchronization of all of that drilling came into fruition. Yeah, and there just felt like a sense of, I am not one person, I am one with team. <laughs> right? One with team. And it might have only lasted for a few minutes, right? When the, all, of the, all of the team was focused in the same way on the same thing and it was working. But the, during those moments, you're not thinking I. And you're not even really thinking very much in words, are you? Right? And this is kind of showing us that without the drilling, without the repetition, you couldn't just have that moment spontaneously with that group of people, unless all of you had done that separately many, many times in the past, right? It's not something that just happened magically. We magically had one of those games where everyone came together. We might have said that, oh, wasn't that magic? We all came together into perfect harmony, but it wasn't magic. It was through repetition and practice, right? You know this feeling? Or similarly with um, learning to play the piano. I'm also terrible at playing the piano. This should be noted, right? You don't even have to be good at it for it to work. 
So I played the piano for six years, grudgingly. I hated it. I didn't want to do it, but we had a piano, so that's what we played. Okay, so I'm uh, practicing the piano, practicing the piano, hating it, by the way, hating practicing it. And then comes the concert. And I decide, well, here is what I've practiced for. Let go and just do it. And no longer do you need to read the music. No longer do you need to think about what com note comes next and what comes next. And there's complete merging and transcendence with you, the instrument, the music, and the people listening. Even when it's a really simple song that you're terrible at, it still works, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so, so okay, so that's like our child version, right? Is that a lot of repetition and practice led to these expansive, quote, no self feelings. But what in fact happened was that you were getting out of the way of connection to the heart. Yeah, all of the things, all of the habits, all of the um, traits of, I don't know, second guessing and how do I look, how does this seem, occasionally they fall away and what is left is a type of open awareness, which is like a natural ability. Yeah, the ability that you were training in was what, the music or the sport, but what it revealed was how your consciousness actually exists, which is very spacious, and very content and not so busy. So that's kind of the way it exists before you've even worked on it, right? Before you've even worked on the mind, that's how it exists when you kind of peel away the surface layers. And then later in life, maybe you have this experience with you know, something that is ultimately not healthy, like drugs and alcohol, or something that is more adult, like a romantic relationship or maybe you start to move into an actual spiritual path. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, why do I want transcendence? Yeah, because a lot of people find ways into it, but are those ways into it something that is gonna be of benefit to all sentient beings and is gonna have a long-term sustainability? So of course, a lot of the interesting experiences and peace and joy and connections we feel in meditation, we could just use heroin right? also, or we could just like have a good acid trip, honestly, right? You know, it, you could just make it happen. But the question is, why do I want it to happen? And do I want it to happen to me or from me? Am I in control of it? or is something that's in control of me? Am I doing it for me, or, if I, or am I experiencing it and enjoying it for the greater good and sending that potentiality and that awakening out from myself? So, you know, we, in a way I want to like demystify transcendence by reminding us that we have moments of it. But now I want us to ask ourselves, when we seek it, and we all seek it in different forms, maybe it's just a very synchronized conversation with your closest friend where you're playing with ideas and there's a beautiful flow and you kind of feel like you're not sure where your thoughts end and theirs begin and it's a beautiful moment. Why are you doing it? Because I think the danger we can fall into is chasing the high of it without remembering the point of it. Yeah, which is why there's so much in Buddhism about remember bodhicitta, remember bodhicitta, remember bodhicitta, because if you become a good meditator, it is blissful, and then you'll forget about everyone needs you. You'll just be like, oh, thank goodness, what a relief. <sighs> I like this state of mind, let's stay here forever. Yeah, and then it can become its own addiction. You can develop single-pointed concentration on an object of attachment. Some spiritual traditions even encourage it. Yeah, you think of something or someone you're attached to, then you like bringing it to your mind's eye, then you develop very good concentration on the basis of it, but your concentration is so intertwined with attachment that in no way are you cutting your negative habits. You've just given yourself another form of entertainment. So it doesn't make you special, it doesn't make you spiritual, it just means you've turned medicine into poison. 
And a lot of people on the spiritual path do this as they're chasing the high or the buzz. Because the high and the buzz is accessible to us. Even without being a great meditator, we've already touched it in different places. So, so the, you know, the call to arms here is to ask ourselves, why do I want it? And then is there, is there a benefit in adjusting my motivation? Is it enough to just go from one moment of transcendence to another, to another, you know, work really hard, save up lots of money to go to a beautiful orchestra arrangement, sit and listen to the orchestra and the sounds all around you and maybe watch a ballet at the same time and be completely blissed out and loving that experience and reinforcing samsara. Or go to the same orchestra, see the same ballet, be completely absorbed and loving it and full of transcendence and think, may all of this joy ripple out from this place and benefit all sentient beings. What I'm touching, I share. What I'm touching, I share. And what's more, it's not from the orchestra or the ballet that I feel this way. It is a condition. My mind is the cause. So I'm not giving credit to this outside thing and deciding it has all the power to give or take happiness or transcendence. You realize anything can be a condition for it. It has always been within your own mind. Because of course you could go to a very good orchestra and a very good ballet and you'd be totally bored. That happens sometimes too. If you're in a bad mood going in, you go, when is this gonna be over? I remember one moment like this when um, it was my job to help introduce a new Geshe from um, India into New Zealand culture. And they picked me because I speak some Tibetan very badly. And um, so I was chosen to kind of like introduce him to Western culture. And so I took him to a farmer's market in New Zealand. And the farmer's market had, you know, arts and crafts and fresh produce and live music. And there was a quartet of women playing Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Yeah, so it was a string quartet in a beautiful area. The women were beautiful, wearing beautiful clothes, and they were really, really well um, practiced. And they were doing the Four Seasons so beautifully. And you know Vivaldi's Four Seasons. It's quite accessible classical music. It's not like hard classical music. So I thought, oh, how wonderful. I'll bring this Geshe to this beautiful Western experience and he'll think how wonderful it is here. And we went and stand in front of the quartet and I'm just thinking, oh, this is just heaven. This is beautiful. And he said, Nintendo, can we go home? I'm bored. <laughs> he was totally bored. Yeah, he was like, what are they doing? What is the thing with them? Why are they doing this thing on the thing? And I don't know, because he had no context for string music. So his labeling on string music was different than mine. Here's me thinking it's beautiful from its own side. From its own side, it gives joy. Not, not for him. He was like, I'm, I'm over it. Let's go home. Millions of examples like this you can think of in your life where you were swept away and thought something was magic and the people around you were like, yeah, I don't really get it. Yeah. If it was transcendent from its own side, everyone would experience it. Yeah. Okay. Thoughts? Thoughts on that? This is all about, you know, just like touching that you have Buddha potential. What are the things that bring it obvious, you know, that make you believe in it? Yeah. And then how do you decide to orient your life in such a way that the touching of it doesn't lead to its own problem? That, oh, this is really new. This is neat. This is different. Now I'm going to do only this, but with my same old afflictive ideas. You know? So we're using our memories of touching the deep stuff then in a way that actually can become enriching and become altruistic and about development. I don't know, is this, is this conversation triggering anybody? Or are you feeling any kind of way? Well, lest, lest we go into um, too much 
poetic woo-woo nonsense of Yuntin, um, we are going back to his holiness now. So page 75, just to prevent any woo-woo. All right. This is the conversation on the idea of individuality versus universality. So the, you know, a danger of this conversation is you start to think that transcendence is connecting with universal oneness, right? That's a, that's an easy mistake to make or some sort of like Jungian collective consciousness, some sort of thing. That's the natural place for the mind to go, which isn't like a hundred percent not the case, but is not as much the case as maybe we've been trained to believe. So this is kind of opening up that conversation of individuality and universality. So I'll just read it to you slowly and then we can kind of unpack it as time goes on. So on page 75, so PM is referring to Dr. Peter Mikkel and DL is referring to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So it's this dialogue back and forth. So um, Dr. Peter Mikkel says, regarding universality and individuality, I think that the Buddhist viewpoint is very close to that of Sri Aryabindu. So if you jump down to the footnote, who that guy is, he's remembered as one of modern India's foremost sages. Born in a wealthy Bengali family, he was educated in England and became a leading figure in the Bengali nationalist movement. It was during his one year imprisonment that his spiritual transformation occurred. Upon his release, he renounced the world and published many books on philosophy. Sri Aryabindu described his spiritual approach as integral yoga, which has been hailed as the only new philosophical system to emerge from contemporary India that is firmly rooted in spiritual experience. This yoga purports to offer a viable spiritual path for the present global crises which Sri Aryabindu understood as a transition from the mental to the present global crises, which Sri Aryabindu understood as a transition from the mental to the supermental consciousness. Okay, so a bit Jungian-ish, ish, not to go out of my lane, but you know, sounds similar. So, so Dr. Peter McHale is saying he thinks that the Buddhist viewpoint is similar to that. Um, who taught that universal and individual are two companion powers. They are opposite poles of a single manifestation. So then His Holiness says, in Buddhism, universal consciousness is completely refuted. There is no universal consciousness. Consciousness is always individual. Buddhism does not accept any concept of an all-encompassing consciousness of which our consciousness is a part. It is very important to understand that individuality is on every level, as I have explained. There is nothing cosmic or universal that goes beyond this individual consciousness. Then Dr. Peter McKell says, what I mean is that in this individual, there can be an expansion into the universal. Lama Anagarika Govinda explains this as follows. Individuality and universality are not mutually exclusive values, but two sides of the same reality. Compensating, fulfilling, and complementing each other, and becoming one in the experience of enlightenment. This experience does not dissolve the mind into an amorphous all, but rather brings the realization of the individual itself contains the totality focalized in its very core. Thus the world that hitherto was experienced as an external reality merges or is integrated into the enlightened mind in the moment in which the universality of consciousness is realized. This is the ultimate moment of liberation from the impediments and fetters of ignorance and illusion. So that's what Govinda says. Then His Holiness says, here we must distinguish between two things. When you refine, develop, and strengthen your mental potential, you are not creating a cosmic consciousness that overpowers all other individual consciousnesses. That is not possible. What does happen is that you transform your mind into an omniscient mind. That state of omniscience is sometimes described as the mind pervading all the phenomena. This does not mean that the fully developed individual mind now controls all phenomena. 
nor does it mean that each individual consciousness comes from this mind. Rather, it means that the mind of an individual is completely enlightened and therefore omniscient. You know everything. There is nothing your mind cannot know. Pervading all means knowing all in this context. What we're looking at here is when you're a Buddha and you're knowing all, all other Buddhas are also knowing all. And so you're all knowing simultaneously, which is as if merging, which is as if collaborating, which is as if oneness, but is not. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a bit like we are all reading this page. So we're all knowing this page, but we're all individually knowing this page simultaneously. Do you understand the distinction that's being made? So it's not that the Dharmakaya is uh, you know, all or ether or oneness in that sense. There's still the individual consciousnesses, which all were individual sentient beings with individual habits and histories and problems and a process of transformation that was specific to them. And at the same time, the nature of everyone's mind is an identical type of mind. They're all clear and knowing. At, that, at this stage, they all have a latent potential and they all have an innate ignorance. That's the same for all of us, but there is an infinite variation of details and things that have happened. And so as we all become enlightened, we all have the same qualities and abilities and knowing, but we also have different karmic connections with different sentient beings because we've had a different amount of time and experience with each one. So this is why in Buddhism we say it's important for everyone to become enlightened, one, for their own sake, but two, because there are people that are going to be helped by you that cannot be helped by anyone else because of the karmic connections that you've made over time. It's just like right now in your life, there are friends that can hear certain things from you because of your love for them, because of the years of relationship built with them, that the same exact words coming from someone else wouldn't land and wouldn't work. So why do you need to become a Buddha as opposed to just achieve nirvana and not suffer anymore? Is for the sake of all of those people you have strong karmic connection with who will only hear it from you. Does that make sense? Yeah, any um, final thoughts before we call it a day? Yeah. So there's no merging of the mind or of the consciousness according no, to what it no merging like pervading yeah pervading so you know you're aware pervading you know you're pervading all phenomena aware of all phenomena at the same time as every other buddha is pervading all phenomena and knowing all phenomena so it's almost like merging but it's there's still an individuality there it's more clear seeing in, yeah in that sense yeah mm -hmm. So it's like the individuality at the level of a Buddha doesn't cause any trouble. It's more in the sense of this individual consciousness has more a connection with these sentient beings. That individual consciousness has more a connection with those sentient beings, but they all have equal knowledge. They all have the same omniscience and are aware of one another. You know, so it's, it's a bit like there is Medicine Buddha and there is Tara and they are equal in all ways. But if we were to look at them side by side, we might have a stronger affinity to one than the other, a stronger connection to one than the other, even though they're identical in ability, our karmic disposition did it dictates closeness. We, yeah, right? yeah. According to, we still have a lot of responsibility. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. But it's not pressure once you're enlightened, it's a joy. <laughs> yeah. So, the, you know, I mean, it's a bit like I'm sure you have a joy when you see your, your kids growing up and learning things that they didn't used to learn or understand when you see your kids maturing and not hurting themselves in the way they used to. It's a joy to watch their development. You know, similarly for Buddhas, I think it's going to be a joy for them to watch our development and to, you know, bring conditions as much as they can. So we'll just take a minute and dedicate and think about bringing these ideas forward into the rest of the day.
life and lifetimes. Thanks guys.